Welcome to the special edition of One on One. We were privileged to spend a considerable amount of time with Nobel laureate Professor Wale Shoinka in his haven in the forest. As you can imagine, you don't get such an opportunity and not seize it with both hands. Oluwole Shoinka was born in Abiokuta during the time of British colonization of Nigeria into an Anglican home. Wale Shoinka's creativity is expansive. He has written songs including in the 1980s releasing an album titled I Love My Country. This, at the time his famous cousin Fela Kuti, was capturing the attention of a global audience. Shoinka also played a prominent role in Nigerian civil society. As a faculty member at the University of Ife, he led a campaign for road safety. A prolific writer, even known as the man of letters, he continues to be a staunch and irrepressible critic of government and societal dysfunctionality. Professor Wale Shoinka has received countless awards. Most notable is the Nobel Laureate Award for Literature, making him the first African author to receive this honor. During this engaging and comprehensive dialogue, we get to pick his brains on a variety of topics, ranging from tribalism to cessation to education to our human rights record, specifically addressing the matter of Shoure's detention, to leadership and even to a small matter of a certain baseball-capped, bicep youth. So you know we have lots in store for you. All that's left for you to do is to sit back and prepare for a stimulating discourse as we kick off on this first in a trilogy of conversations with Professor Wale Shoinka. I am Ekene Ezeji. Thank you for having us in your home, sir. You're welcome. Just to set the record straight, when I was looking into your biography, I was a little surprised that you're 85 years old. I had to do the, is that correct? 85 plus, yes. Wow, yeah. So what that tells me is that you have a long and enduring, do I say affair with Nigeria? Um, well, yes, long and enduring love-hate relationship. Okay. Yes. Would you say that the way you looked up to Nigeria as a young man, would you say it has altered significantly as the way you look down on it now, if that's the right term? No question at all. There's been quite a, a hefty change from, let's say, the Nigeria of my youth uh, and also the Nigeria of my expectations. Uh, but I think that applies to many people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll explore a bit more of where the changes have come in as we, as we discuss. As we celebrate 59 years of independence, a lot of people have pointed to education as being at the heart of where we missed it. And so I want to sort of compare your own experience. Um, I read that you went from the University of Ibadan to Leeds as a young man in your 20s. And some would feel that you had a very privileged educational background compared with what we have today. Can you see a comparison between the environment the youths are exposed to now and the way they think and the way they respond to, to, to things around them? Well, one thing which I would like to stress from the very beginning, since you mentioned the fact that I went uh, overseas to complete my studies, uh, is that um, those who did not go either from my generation, they're in their own fields, they're just as prominent, as successful, and as uh, fulfilled, maybe, you know, uh, professionally, as I, often uh, feel and so it's uh, of course I could have gone a very different way if I had not changed the environment okay. you know better or worse it doesn't matter but just change but I, I like to compare myself with my colleagues my peers those with whom uh, I was at the um, University College of Ibadan you know before I then went to specialize in uh, mm -hmm. English literature and uh, the contrast between all of us as a group and the new generation now uh, at the kind of age at which we were before we all scattered to the four winds. The contrast is depressing. It really is depressing. And sometimes I feel obliged to, te to tell the, the generation we're speaking about now that I think that we owe them an apology. Where on earth, how on earth we derailed along the educational line is a very complex issue. It has to do with the various kind of governments we've had, the military incursion. It has to do with the petroleum um, 
boon, quote unquote, and what it did to the mental attitude of uh, generations uh, up to that. Uh, but definitely there has, and I think all of us will admit, it's been a massive deterioration in the level of education. Mm. I read somewhere that you were telling the youths to stop writing rubbish on the internet. But now you say you owe them an apology. Perhaps you're drawing a link between where they are and what we've bequeathed to them, the, the, the legacy we've left for them. Yes, worse than that, I had to tell some of them sometimes. I said, you know, I'm sorry that I don't want to sound, I want you to understand that I'm not being condescending or being dismissive of you. But the reality is that today, and I said this to a couple of times, just a few days ago, where you as graduates are today educationally, we were at secondary school leaving age. Oh, wow. It is as bad as that. And I'm talking not merely in terms of uh, articulation, ability to express, just the understanding mm -hmm. of events, of phenomena, the ability to analyze. Definitely today's graduate, in many cases, you know, they're exceptional colleges, of course. In many cases, today's graduate is at the level at which we were just before we left school. Wow. I know you said there are many things that could have uh, resulted in that, but mm -hmm. let's try and tease out a few things. I mean, one of the ones I want to bring to your attention is they say now in the universities, you have a room that would normally hold about two or three inhabitants holding up to 20 people sleeping in shifts or even a lecture theater that maybe should hold 100 people, and you have 2,000 registered students. Are these some of the things that begin to sort of explain mm -hmm. the hustle, if I use that term, hustle mentality our youths? Quite right. The environment is very critical. Environment. Let me tell you a horror story, which you might find difficult to believe. Um, when I was teaching in one of the colleges, in one of the universities here, I won't mention which, I don't want to embarrass them because I know others are probably at the same stage. My own children were uh, passed through that particular university. And my daughter came to me. They used to come to my house. I had my residence there, use the toilet, go to the bathroom, etc., etc., and of course, beef up on, the, on the <laughs> unnecessary yes. foodstuffs and so on. And one day, she actually compelled me to come and take a look at their toilet. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. In the women's room. I opened the door. From the floor, all the way to the toilet seat. It was littered with excrement. Oh, I thought you might say that. Yeah, I'm afraid it's true. The whole place was swimming, maggots, and so on. And I said, how long has this been going on? He said, for at least a year. I said, couldn't you even, and this is the difference also, it's very important. Okay, let's say the authorities were negligent, criminally negligent, to have allowed those in charge of the, of the hostel, to have allowed that state to have been reached. But even the students themselves, and this is when I talk about the difference, mm. there's no way in my time, I assure you, that such situation would have been allowed even for one day. We'd have got together and okay. done something about it. But there they were. They were coming in and each one was adding oh. his or her own load. So that from the door, it's a, it's, it's a vision I, I can never get out of my head. Both the vision and the odor. Yeah, and the smell and everything. And so um, and we took action of course and then you know, moved on from there. But there it was, the staff you know, in charge, let's say the housekeeper, the, uh, what are they called, the master or mistress of the hall, whatever, everybody culpable. But for me, ultimately, the students themselves, that they actually allow that state. And how can you study in that environment? Now, you're talking also about, of course, the living room, uh, the, the living space, yes. where you study, where you eat, where you, you know, discuss, and I consider when I was in Teda Hall, before I went overseas in the university, one room to myself with a small uh, kitchenette. And it, it, the environment itself was conducive to reading, to exchanging ideas, to being lazy, to being mischievous also mm. without being criminal. And the difference is very important. Mm. Today, 
they even confuse being mischievous and rascally with being criminal. So when we're talking about education, we're talking about a thoroughgoing formulation of the individual. And it is depressing, the contrast between then and now. I want to pick up on something you said, which is, you know, you wouldn't have let the situation subsist for even a day. Mm -hmm. And that tells me that you, your generation seem to have a more proactive mindset. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I want to sort of look at your early days. Um, I read that you were arrested and kept in prison for 22 months because you asked for a ceasefire during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, how did that shape you, or, or maybe you were already thinking like that before you were arrested, <laughs> but how did that shape your convictions as a young man? Well, I wonder which came before, the chicken or the <laughs> egg. It's yes. so very difficult. I, I grew up in this Abelkuta in the, mid, in, uh, in, in, the, in, in the heart of a fervor, a, a nationalist sensibility, uh, which did not uh, wait for the incursion of the colonial powers to, to get honed. In other words, our own history here has always been a history of questioning power, yes. authority, of revolting against excessive, even traditional authority. We have the record of having chased out uh, a very powerful order in this city, and this is a kind of atmosphere in which I grew up. And of course, my own parents, a circle of uh, middle class, lower middle class intellectuals, used to debate among themselves so many issues. I was a great eavesdropper, as many of my own generation also. And we, we were curious people, and at least I was very curious as a child and very argumentative. In other words, I had a tendency not to accept things at their face value unless you explained them to me and I was satisfied. Okay. I had, then there's peace. Yes. <laughs> so we, the, the, the favor was the, the fervor, you know, uh, was there, there was tumult, but it was in a sense of, sense was made out of the tumult. We were able to analyze and to distinguish between sight and tumult. Mm -hmm. Today, I'm not very sure that that kind of basic uh, intellectual awareness of environment, of phenomena, of events around you, including of a seas event. Yes. I'm not very sure that um, very many of the young generation grasp it gen generally. W what they understand by student activism is sometimes just destroy. That the more you destroy, the more activist you are, the more okay. radical, which of course is just not true. Mm. So there's a lot of confusion about values about men, you know, the mental disposition, what it should be, a student. Uh, we're speaking about the worst, you know. It's, it's not... It's not yeah, across I, I don't want to be too mm. negative, but yes. I'm talking about what, as a teacher, I had to cope with when I was in Ibadan, when I was uh, in Ife, when I, in Lagos. These sort of things I try to impart to yeah. my students outside classes. Um, people have said, or some, someone inferred that you had some sympathy towards the Biafran cause because you spoke up for them. I just want you to repeat what I heard you say, if, if you remember your reaction to, I think, one of the interviews I listened to. So the they, tendency they, towards... What you had some sympathies for the Biafran cause because that was what led you to being imprisoned because you asked... Oh, to the Biafran cause? Yes. Uh -huh. So what, what would you say to that, that people have said because you spoke up for, for mm. Biafra, mm. therefore you have sympathies towards the Biafran cause, what would you say to that? Yeah, well, I look at it, uh, yeah, I look at society in terms of the humanity inside it. I think, uh, and all of us will agree that basically, nation is an artificial construct. Uh, it's, it, you, you don't apprehend nation the same way as you apprehend other human beings. The other human beings are feeling, thinking, uh, creating, uh, producing entities. A nation is you know, convenient, necessary, you know, in terms of human development, necessary evil sometimes. Mm. Mm. And so the will of the people for me matters over and above any kind of <clears throat> notion of how people should be. Okay. Yeah, the, what, what do people really want for themselves? And so basically, I don't hold 
things like secession as anything criminal okay. whatsoever. It's history is involved, vision is involved. And if circumstances arise in which a people, a collectivity, feel that they don't belong any longer, they have a right to try and determine their future cause. Slogans like, um, united we stand, divided we fall, for me it's just balderdash. Okay. It, it's just a pure sentiment. Okay. The important thing is, what is a productive human unit? What is the most productive human unit? For I get so irritated when I hear expressions like, the sovereignty of this union uh, is not negotiable. What, what sovereignty are you talking about? Mm. The question is, how do the people within that sovereignty live? Sovereignty is an extract from the humanity, not the other way around. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, you know, looking at that and looking at where we are, because we're looking at Nigeria at 59, largely we're, mm. we're trying to understand how we got to where we are and where we are looking to. Mm. Are you surprised that you still have groups like the Biafran voice, voices being heard today, dissenting voices, so to speak, still pulling away, even now, as you did then, are you surprised it's still alive and, and mm. yeah? At the time, I warned, um, I said, you cannot kill Biafra. I said, the, the Biafran concept cannot die. I was misunderstood, it was part of why I was picked up, you know, among other activities, but I remember that this statement was read out to me, that what did I mean, that Biafra can never be defeated. And I, and I told them, I said, I'm not talking about battlefield. Anybody can win if you have sufficient will, determination, and weaponry, and money. you can win a war. Uh, you can win a battle. You can even win a war. But it doesn't mean that you have defeated an idea. Mm. And once an idea has taken hold among people, an idea which is based on the humanity of those people, their experience, and their vision for themselves, it's not something you can kill. And so it is up to the rest and the, the unit, which wants, you know, which feels so strongly, to sit down together and negotiate how they relate to one another. I think that a war, a war in the name of unity, that concept of unity, is one of the most stupid activities humanity can engage in. Oh, wow. To say that it's actually noble to decimate one another. So you can because stay together. you want to keep boundaries. I, I, it's something which, whether it's my upbringing, whether it's things I've read, whether it's some, something I've eaten or whatever, I just find it totally ignoble for human beings to go to war with one another simply because you want to force an entity to remain within a larger unit. I don't care whether we're talking about Soviet Union, their history, I don't care whether we're talking about Europe. I don't care whether we're talking about Asia. I believe that if necessary, nations should die just as, so that humanity can survive and survive as really fulfilled, enviable entities for the lower species. Hmm. So. So, so really you're saying we sh the people of Biafra should have been allowed to go their, their way if that was their wish. I, and I, any other group that I wants believe, to go their way. I believe in the plebiscite. Hmm. The plebiscite, which is the correct uh, assessment of a people's yeah. direction. I mean, I've looked at some small units. Look at Nigeria as big as it is. I know tomorrow I will hear that Wale Shunka is preaching this secession. <laughs> but as far as I'm concerned, we're having a discussion yes. about possibilities and expressions for humanity, of the will of the people. Not even just, not just Nigeria alone. Yes. We're talking about the history of the world. We're talking about the experience of the world. We have, we're asking ourselves, why is it that the Scottish want to pull away from the United Kingdom? Okay. Why was there an Irish war of secession yes. in which so-called genuine acts of terrorism continued for as, re as recently as a decade or so ago, you see, had elements of the Irish secession is setting up uh, bombs somewhere. Margaret Thatcher was nearly demolished by mm -hmm. the Irish uh, movement. Yeah. I've been involved in some aspects of that with, you know, without even my uh, knowing. I met Mrs. Mary Robinson uh, a few years ago at a conference. Okay. And I, I said to her, I said, you'll not believe it. I said, but I have a small, tiny footnote of participation 
in the Irish War of Independ uh, Wars of Independence. So I'll tell you all about the incident later on. Okay. So humanity constantly agitates to re realize itself in many ways. And no amount of slogan can ever destroy that will, that sense of reassessing your position at any given time and saying, wait a minute, no, we can move in a far more fulfilling way. So it's something humanity has to cope with. Let's get away from slogans. I want to talk a bit more about your interest and the fact that a lot of your work is inspired by Yoruba mythology. Why is that, in case it's not obvious? Um, let's put it this way, that very early on in life, I became very skeptical about religion itself. And what was the religion which, uh, in which I was immersed from childhood? It was Christianity. Okay. What other religions did I find around me which were considered um, uh, the, the alternative, shall we say, mm -hmm. to Christianity? There was Islam. I looked at the two of them and I really didn't see much difference in terms of spirituality between Christianity and Islam and the sort of uh, the elements of traditional religion, the Orisha, which of course in my childhood was very much suppressed. But fortunately, my Ishara, Asme, uh, the Ishara line of my uh, birth and upbringing mm. was very strong. Uh, I had a grandfather who was a, you know, an Orisha uh, follower until the poor man was converted to Christianity and started going to church, became less interesting as far as <laughs> concerned. But, uh, I was fascinated by that thing which was suppressed, which others said, ah, don't touch, in which you even got beaten. In some cases, if you were seen moving around the so-called Orisha people, of course, I became more curious about it. And as I said, I tended to analyze things. And so from very early age, I was a chorister, by the way, I used to okay. go to church regularly. I began to be interested in this forbidden religion and which my, to which my grandfather and his side of things also belonged. And I, found, I found the Orisha more fascinating, richer in many ways, and I found all three as I grew up, secondary school, I found they all converged. Okay. The same principle of something beyond us as human beings. Mm -hmm. So this artistic heritage became for me a, a handhold on and interpreted in so many ways of humanity itself. Okay, that's interesting. That's what happened. Yeah. Um, I want to bring that uh, to play into where we are now as a nation, the way I perceive it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I perceive that we have more and more people pulling to their tribal, do you say, le legacy or even looking, seeking identification in tribal mm -hmm. allegiances. Would you say that there is um, a kind of, uh, I'm looking for the right word, where you have a tension if people mm -hmm. are pulling towards the tribal allegiances mm -hmm. as opposed to the message we're all meant to be pro projecting, which is one Nigeria? Would you say there's a tension in that? There is uh, a tension. There's no question at all. There's an instinct, a human instinct. When things go wrong in a larger uh, um, a larger encapsulation of reality, we tend to withdraw to what we are inwards, to what we are sure of. I mean, you are sure of the family. Yeah. You know everybody. You, you know the wishes. You relate to them. You interact with them. Okay. Outside of that, you have a clan. When things go wrong on the national level, there's always that. Some also retreat into religion. Yes. So you have ethnicity on the one hand, you have religion, the other, you have clannishness, the other. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Okay. It's when you attempt to control the larger entity through the very narrow perspectives and the narrow demands of your smaller entity. That is where, for me, the real problem begins. But if you grant equality to other members of the greater of the larger community, the larger family, yes. then you are able to sit down and negotiate with the others. Say, oh, this is the way we see things. This is the way we want. Uh, don't uh, intrude on 
things which pertain to this entity, which existed before the larger entity, and in fact, on which the larger entity is based. Don't now say because you are physically bigger, therefore, the smaller entity should not exist. Well, we've got to respect all the components, all the constituent parts of the larger community. But some people are obsessed by domination. Whether we're talking about religious domination, ethnic domination, they're obsessed by it. Look, for instance, even at the language. Let's come down from the abstractions to reality. Yes. Look at the language, for instance, of this Mayeti Allah people, okay. the nomadic uh, yes. herdsmen. Look at the language of the leader. When we were here, even those who are not affected, talking about the hundreds of farmers, of villagers who were being killed. Do you remember one of them now going back in history, say, what are they talking about? We are the original rulers of these people who are complaining. They are there virtually by our grace. I mean, not one sensibility towards the horrors being undergone by the, let's say, the Benue uh, uh, people. We take that as the, you know, for example. No, that is arrogant thing that we Fulani, we, we conquered these complainants. What, what are they complaining about? Now, that is where the problem began. That's there was no human feeling, there was no respect even for what those villagers have become in the meantime, no respect for their con productive contribution to the larger entity. No, it was that we have a right to take our cattle through your farms and if you stop us, it's nothing wrong with killing you. Mm. So that's where the problem is. It's not ethnic consciousness. Ethnic consciousness is rich especially in artistic productivity. Ethnic consciousness produces culture. Culture begins with the ethnic group with, because this is one of the earliest communities. Also, it has a richer history, artistic history, a collectivity of experiences, you know, from little, little units, had an organic way of producing, reproducing their own existence, an organic way of farming, of harvesting from which culture also derives. So that, we, we cannot destroy it. Mm -hmm. Even those external people who used to deride tribes, the uh, former colonial masters, used to talk down and try, oh, see, their problem is tribalism. Mm -hmm. They're far more tribal in Scotland mm -hmm. and Ireland than we are here in Avokuta uh, and Bear and uh, uh, Shakiri or Land or uh, Benue, or, you know. So we've been brainwashed into accepting the inferior designation of tribes and ethnic groups. But tribe is the basis of what we call nation today. We'll take a break at this point, but there's much more to come. Look out for part two in the trilogy, where we'll be discussing matters to do with tribalism. Show raised attention in the context of our human rights record, amongst others. I am Ekene Ezeji. <laughs>